All right, hello and welcome. Uh, good morning to those of you who are in the same time zone uh, and uh, good afternoon or evening to the others. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, while we're waiting for everyone to join, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself uh, and say hello in the chat to everyone. Uh, we'll wait another minute to get started so that everybody can join us. Uh, and uh, yeah, our um, our theme today will be the shape of things to come. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when uh, in about another minute. So, oh yeah, if anybody wants some uh, closed captioning, you can enable that now. Excellent. So I think we can now start moving on. Uh, oh, we're already joined by about 90 people. That is excellent. Hello to you. Right. So as I mentioned, the theme of today is the shape of the things to come. And uh, that is because, uh, you know, we'll we'll give you an update on uh, or a recap on the recent progress uh, on some main initiatives. Uh, but we will also start introducing some of the work that will be happening uh, and, uh, you know, in the in the coming months. And we'll also uh, invite some of your input as well um, and ask you to, to provide some feedback on, on some of those initiatives too. Uh, so let's move on. Um, as this call happens twice today, you see that, um, that there are many colleagues involved uh, in delivering the talks. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I will be joined today <clears throat> uh, by uh, Jenny Hendricks, our director, uh, our community director, uh, and uh, by Martin Rittman, who is a product uh, manager, uh, Amanda Bartel, uh, who is uh, head of uh, um, member experience, uh, and uh, uh, Lena Stoll, uh, who is also a product manager. Uh, and will be uh, aided by the lovely Marina Kovalyeva, uh, in, um, who will be supporting the Q and A. And I'm obviously Cora Cordes, uh, head of uh, community engagement and communications. Uh, so um, we'd love to. Uh, oh, also we will hear from uh, Patricia uh, Finney, but that will be via recording because it's a bit early for her. Uh, so we're hoping that this will be a, a productive and in, uh, and welcoming meeting for everybody uh, according to our uh, code of conduct. So please, if you have any concerns, do uh, let us know. Uh, and in terms of the agenda, what we'll cover today, uh, we'll talk about progress uh, towards our strategic uh, goals. Uh, and uh, But we will do that briefly. <clears throat> then we'll have a discussion about our recently launched uh, project uh, about resourcing crosser for future sustainability. And we'll invite, and we'll invite some of your feedback as well. Uh, then uh, Martin will take us through our product roadmap and what you can expect in the coming months. Uh, and uh, we'll also have a slightly deeper dive in some of the specific updates about the metadata pipeline development. Uh, our um, grants system for funders and our new <clears throat> content registration form. Uh, and then obviously there will be time for some final questions. So all that we'll need to cover in 90 minutes. So let's start without further ado. And I shall now share the controls with Jenny. Okay, thank you very much. Ah, I have controls as well. Um... Okay, in that case, I'll move to the next slide. Great. Um, yeah, as Cora said, this uh, the theme today is the shape of things to come, and we can't really talk about what's to come without uh, a little recap and reminder of what our overall um, purpose and, and mission is. Um, and in uh, 2023, we set out these four big strategic themes, and you can see them all uh, at crossref.org slash strategy. Um, and that gives a lot more narrative, and it also gives a sort of a quadrant of what's been achieved and what's in, in progress and what's coming next for each of these themes. Um, of course, many of the projects we work on touch on all of these goals um so uh it's a, it's an interesting way of organizing our projects um and i will go through all of the things currently in progress um but first just explain a little bit about these four themes um so the first one contribute to an environment where 
the community identifies and co-creates solutions for broad benefit. So we do that, you know, in all teams um, by engaging with the community. Uh, we have a lot of partnerships, um, both formal and informal, and we support and uh, engage with many other organizations in the scholarly uh, landscape. Um, the the one in red uh, is about uh, our research nexus goal, and that's all about becoming a sustainable source of complete, open and global scholarly metadata and relationships. And we're working towards that vision. We want to demonstrate and show evidence of the value of richer and connected open metadata and incentivize people to meet kind of best practices. So um, we're always uh, encouraging members to look at their uh, records and add more richness where they can uh, with additional metadata such as other identifiers like ORCIDs and ROARs, um, clinical trial information, uh, abstracts, references and all sorts of good stuff like that so that we can allow the whole community to make connections um, and uh, through that metadata corpus. The yellow one is all about the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. Um, we do uh, have, we've always had a focus and a principle on broad community governance. Um, and these 16 um, principles have allowed us to sort of check our work against a few um, rules, really. Um, so things like open code that is forkable by the community, um, transparent operations, um, so policies and, um, you know, documents and the way that we work uh, are all open on our website. So that's a really, um, a really key kind of guiding set of set of rules for us. Um, and then the last one is about fostering a strong team, which you could say is only internal, but um, it does match our kind of ethos and the way we work with the community. So we try to have fair uh, policies and working practices and try and, you know, balance um, uh, how we resource things and try and be sort of accountable to each other and to the community. Okay, so I've got, um, okay, there we go. I've got a couple of things listed under what's in progress for each of these four themes, um, and I'm not going to go into all of them. Those in bold will be um, uh, embellished and um, dug into a little bit more later in this in this call today. Um, but uh, yeah, in if I just move on my slides myself. Mm -mm. Yeah, this one is really all about sort of collective action. And we have um, obviously our community engagement team, but also our research and development team. And um, we have partnerships with people like um, DOAJ and the Public Knowledge Project. And we work really closely with Orkin Data Sites. Um, we're trying to make things easier, basically, for the researcher. Um, one of the themes we've been looking at, um, actually, it's not really new, but we're more formalizing around it, is the integrity of the scholarly record. Um, so almost almost everything we do can be uh, a signal of trust, every piece of metadata. And we're trying to organize that around the integrity of the scholarly record, um, which is part of the broader uh, work of research integrity that a lot of our members are concerned with at the moment. And you can read all about that on our blog. Um, our similarity check tool, uh, we're developing constantly. There's currently um, an AI detection tool in beta testing. Um, so contact us if you want to hear more about that. And yeah, we'll hear more about grants and uh, funders joining this whole community. And we'll also talk about the funder registry and uh, aligning it with the raw registry later in the session. Um, so moving on to the second goal, this is really where we have all of the metadata and relationships projects. Um, again, everything in bold we'll dig into and give a fuller update on later in the session. Um, and I would pick out from here really that number six there, which is the kind of priorities that we see for our community. We really want to encourage references, abstracts. We want um, members to pick up grant IDs that are now being um, created by funders through Crossref and uh, RAW. So we've got community engagement and um, 
sort of campaigns um, through for those top priority metadata um, elements. Um, it's also worth saying here as well is that we can't be completely global without um, making ourselves accessible to all parts of the world and all corners of um, the community. So we're trying really hard to um, understand barriers to joining Crossref and some of them are technical. So indeed we work with public knowledge project and others to try and have plugins and uh, easier ways to sort of integrate with Crossref. Um, and we also launched the GEM program last year, which is global equitable membership um, so that we can include um, those that, you know, find the 275 fee a year just too steep. Um, we will be talking about fees after I stop talking, um, and that is probably one of the biggest focuses for today. Um, other things to mention here are, yeah, I mean, we've got um, that last point there, automating membership processes. This is really, you could consider fairly internal, but um, our processes are very, very manual, and we have probably about 200 new members joining every month. And so we've been extending, you know, our staff and actually use a lot of contractors to try and manage the process. And so now we've got Marina, actually, who's also helping in the chat um, to help us kind of steer towards automating a lot of these processes and in integrating systems like our membership database with application forms and things like that so that we can have even more members joining and, uh, and getting a good a good sort of experience with us. Uh, the third one is all about POSI, and yeah, most of these will be mentioned later on. Um, <clears throat> one thing maybe is just that top one is we have, there's now about 17 organisations that have adopted the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. Um, and we, I guess a couple of years ago, kind of started an informal get together um, we have a Slack channel um, and occasionally have a meeting. Um, last year, they that group did uh, refine and clarify some of the points of the POSI principles and launched POSI version 1.1. Um, and there may be more substantive changes coming. And these are, will all be based on the actual experiences of the 17 organizations trying to um, meet these principles for you know, more transparency, broader governance and um, insurance, so um, forkability. So if something happens to us, uh, the community can can take over because uh, everything will be open. And lastly, and then I will uh, finish up and hand over, is the foster a strong team uh, goal. And it's not, you know, it's not about our metadata or our work, but it is really important. We've gone from about 25 staff to almost 50 in the last five to seven years. Um, and we've gone all remote um, and closed our offices. So uh, it's quite a lot of focus for us to think about, you know, how we're working together um, and also how we meet each other. What can we do asynchronously online between ourselves, but also with the community? And we're looking at projects to better track our carbon emissions, for example. Um, we've cut travel quite a lot. And we, uh, Ed and uh, a group looking at this data will be writing a blog post in the coming weeks um, to report on our um, environmental impact uh, of 2023, I think. Um, yeah, so I think I will leave it there. Hopefully this gives a flavor of the kinds of things that we're focused on and, um, sets up um more uh you know a bit of context for something some other things we'll hear later on uh i've just seen a new slide which is all about <laughs> the board uh election and this is a uh, yeah we have a call out lucy has um uh posted a um a call for expressions of interest to be on our 
on our board. Uh, speaking of broad governance, um, so any active member organisation can apply. So active means you've ha actually registered some DOIs. You have to be um, active um, in that way. Um, and we are particularly seeking funding organisations. We have a small number of funders, but they're as members at the moment, maybe 35 um, but their perspective is really important. So we're really encouraging fund funders to um, apply to the board. And yeah, it's four meetings a year. One is in person uh, and ideally at least one committee. So we obviously have an audit committee. Um, we have the membership and fees committee, which you'll hear a lot about next. Um, and we have a nominating committee and a executive committee. Um, and it's really well set up. We've got an excellent board, really good chair. It's a very positive vibe, I would say. So um, give it a go. Uh, OK, with that, I will uh, pass it on to Amanda and look at the chat to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ginny. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk a bit today about um, a new programme that we started uh, just at the end of last year, which is called the RCFS programme, which is all around resourcing Crossref for future sustainability. So I'm going to start with giving a little bit of background on the programme. And then we're going to move on to sharing the results of some uh, recent research that we did with some members and also compare the results of that research with those of you on the call today. And at the end of the session, um, we'll be asking for feedback and questions um, about the programme. Um, if you could put your any feedback or questions into the Q&A box rather than the chat box, so pop it into Q&A and then we'll be able to answer some of them live at the end um, and also just manage the answers a bit better. Um, and do add questions into Q&A while I'm talking as well. You don't have to wait until the end. So the programme background. Um, so um, we want to make sure that Crossref is um, sustained for the long term. So we need to make sure that the way we are resourced um, gives that longevity and sustainability. Um, so we've we've started this programme to look at the way our fees are structured to um, ensure we've got that sustainability. Now, often if um, organise organisations are doing this sort of a programme, it's because there's a problem, you know, they're looking for a quick fix to a financial problem. Um, but we're in a really lucky position. We're doing this uh, programme from the comfort of being in a solid financial position. Um, we're sustained by our programme fees. Um, we've had uh, ongoing growth um, through our fees. Um, and any um, increases in revenue have come from volumes, not price increases. So we haven't actually increased our um, basic membership or content registration fees in 15 years. Increase or decrease, they haven't changed. So we're in a, in a lucky position. Um, but um, we want to make sure that that continues and we start thinking about the future and making sure we're, we're properly set up for the shape of things to come because things are changing. Um, and the reason we decided to do this now is um, as the world has evolved, as we've uh, started collecting new record types, we have different types of members, we have different types of users of our metadata, our fee schedules have become overly complex. And we also want to make sure that they are equitable and fair to all the new types of organisations that now become members. So because of this, we created um, this programme. So um, this was initially discussed with our board back in July 2023. Um, and they agreed that we should create this programme to do a thoughtful, comprehensive review that centres on long-term vision and plans, um, is guided 
um, by our fee principles and includes the board, staff and community input and has details of an implementation plan. So that's the, the, the main focus of the programme. So to kick it off, we started working with a third party research consulting um, in from November 2023, I think. Um, they reviewed our current situation and they came up with 11 potential fee changes that we might want to investigate further that would have a positive impact. And we've selected uh, five of those to investigate this year and next year. But obviously more, um, more of those projects might follow in subsequent years. So the program itself, it's we've identified three key goals. So the first one is around making fees more equitable. The second one is all around simplifying our complex fee schedule. And the final one is around rebalancing revenue sources. And in a moment, I'm going to go through each of those goals in turn and give a bit more information. But before I do that, I just wanted to uh, note that none of the program goals mention um, increased revenue or increased fees um, specifically. Um, we don't yet know what the outcome of this program will be. It might be that for some members, some fees increase, but it also might be for other members, some fees decrease. Um, and what we're aiming for here is, is pretty much revenue neutral outcomes, um, as long as that keeps that long term sustainability. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd mention that before we go any further. So let's take a look at those um, goals one by one. So our first goal around making fees more equitable, that's really focused on our annual membership fees for all of our members. <clears throat> now, these fees, um, they're invoiced once a year and they are tiered. So uh, members pay different fees depending on which tier their organisation falls into. And we set those tiers based on the annual publishing revenue of that organisation. Um, and if the organisation doesn't have any publishing revenue, we look at the expenses they spend on their publishing activities. So project one is to undertake a focused piece of work looking at the very lowest membership fee tier. So the very lowest membership fee tier is for organisations uh, whose publishing revenue annually is less than one million US dollars. And that sort of made sense when we started and when a lot of our members were um, publishing organisations, commercial publishing organisations. But as our membership has changed, um, that lowest fee tier potentially doesn't make sense anymore. Because if you think about it, the difference between one US dollar in annual revenue and one million is a very, very wide tier. So we want to take a deeper look at that tier and just make sure that it's still fit for purpose with our new, our new members. Um, we have, uh, and project two um, is still around the membership fee, but it's more around that basis of those tiers. So I mentioned before, we base those tiers on the publishing revenue for each organisation. Um, but as our, as our members have uh, changed, just the very basis of those tiers doesn't make as much sense. Um, we started um, back in 2000. Most of our members were publishers. Um, but nowadays, most of our members don't uh, self-identify as publishers, first and foremost. In fact, um, most of them identify as research institutions. And we also have many other types of members, um, banks, museums, um, government bodies, funders, um, botanic gardens, um, all sorts. So basing that membership fee on your publishing revenues doesn't make quite so much sense anymore. So those are the two projects that we're going to be looking at under that first goal. 
So goal number two is all around simplifying that complex fee structure. Um, so I mentioned before, our, our fee schedules have really evolved over the years as we've added new content types, new record types. Um, we've added volume discounts into the mix. Um, we charge different fees depending on the type of content members register, different fees um, depending on whether that content is current, uh, so published in the current year or two years previously, or backfile, older content. Um, and there's also lots of different volume discounts on some of these com of these content types. So it's a fairly complex picture. Um, it's difficult for us to manage programmatically, but it's also difficult for our members to be able to plan effectively for any spend with Crossref. So under goal two, we've got two projects. So project three is um, looking really closely at those backfile discounts and trying to work out if it still makes sense to include those backfile discounts. And project four is reviewing low use record types and specifically volume discounts. Um, and the aim here is all around reducing that complexity for everyone. And finally, goal three. Um, goal three is all around um, rebalancing revenue sources. So there's one project that sits under this goal. And what we really want to do here is reflect an increase in our metadata usage. So the numbers of uh, users who are coming to our APIs and tools to source the metadata, and also a perceived shift in a value towards that metadata distribution. Um, so where we'll be focusing this year and next will be looking at the subscription fees for our paid for Metadata Plus service. So that's our three goals and the projects that um, sit under those goals. So as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, all of this um, needs to happen with input from the community, our members, our board of directors, um, but also a really key group here is our membership and fees committee. Now the membership and fees committee um, has been going since 2001 um, and their purpose is to report recommendations to the board to any changes to fees or fee policies for any of our services or, or processes. Um, and they are heavily involved in this um, process. Um, this first slide here has the first half of the membership and fees committee. Um, if there's anybody on the call who's on the membership and fees committee, do, do say hello in the chat and identify yourself. Um, so if I just go on to the next slide, you'll see the second half of the membership and fees committee. Um, so we've tried really hard um, in recent years to expand the membership and fees committee and just make sure that it really does represent the new shape of our membership. So we've got representatives from different regions, different member types, different sizes of, of member organization, just to make sure we're getting we're getting the right sort of feedback. And just as a side note, wanted to say thank you um, to the membership and fees committee for all all the time they've put into the project so far and all the time they're going to be putting into this project over the next year and a bit. OK, but there's there's obviously more input than just the uh, membership and fees committee. Um, we've got uh, surveys. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to be talking a bit more about um, a recent survey that we did with um, members in the lowest fee category. There's also going to be follow up focus groups where we want to look in depth um, into um, particular groups or, or particular bits of feedback we might have got from the survey that are particularly interesting. We've obviously got um, regular calls with the community, like this call today, where we're hoping to get some input. Um, but we're not only speaking to members, we also want to make sure we're speaking to non-member organisations to see if we can find out more about 
what barriers there might exist um, for them joining Crossref. Um, and I'll put a I'll put, there's a link at the end um, to a blog post where we've actually put an RFI out for some support in uh, getting some input from non-member communities. So goal one. Um, we're going to talk a bit more about goal one today um, because we've recently undertaken a survey with members in the lowest fee tier to help give us some input, some data, some views to help us with project one and project two. So this fee, it was sent out to the 8,000 odd member organisations who fall into that lowest annual fee category. And we asked some questions about member size, funding model, um, and also how their uh, the fees they spend with Crossref fit into their wider expenses. So far, we've had responses from nearly a thousand organizations, um, which is a 12% response rate, but it's still open. So if your organization is in the lowest fee tier and you haven't yet completed the survey, please do, because the more data we can get, the better. And the survey's open until May 12th. Um, it will have been emailed, um, I think, Cora, to the primary contact on each account. Is that correct? Yes, the primary and uh, the billing contact as well, actually. So Lovely. hopefully um, you will have received it. Thank you. Perfect. Um, one of the things, um, looking at the responses we've had so far, one of the things we wanted to be clear about was that we were getting good uh, representation in the responses from all members. So one way we can cut that is by looking at um, responses by continent. So I'm just showing a bar chart on the screen. I'll describe it for those who maybe can't see the screen. So it's a, a bar chart along the X axis we have each continent and the Y axis is number of member organizations. For each continent, there's two bars. There's a bar that shows the total number of members we have in that continent. And the second bar, the blue bar, shows the number of respondents to the survey we had from organizations on that continent. So overall, we had a 12% response rate, but the good news is um, every single continent gave us at least a 10% response rate. So we're, we're really pleased that we've managed to get a good, a good breadth of answers. Okay, so we thought we'd um, start by um, giving the results of the survey so far, but we thought it would be interesting to compare the results with um, those of you who are on the call today. So the way we're going to do that is um, we've taken a few of the questions from the pop, from the uh, survey, and we're going to pop up a poll for those of you on the call to provide an answer for your organisation. Um, we'll have a quick look at the results and then we'll compare that with the survey results we got from the uh, members in that lowest fee tier. So to start with, we just want to try and get a quick straw poll of how many of the attendees today are actually from that lowest membership fee tier. So I'm just going to see if I am able to launch a poll. I think I can. Okay, can I just ask one of my fellow hosts to confirm whether folks can see the poll? We can see it, yeah. So, everybody else on the call, if you can see the poll, um, please do select the relevant tier for your organisation. So these tiers are what we use to, um, to set the membership fees. Um, I'll give it I'll give it a few moments for people to fill out the poll. Mm. 
Okay, looks like the voting has finished. Let me end the poll and share the results. So it looks like actually the results here, they um, they map quite nicely actually to overall um, membership. So about 80% of those of you who responded are actually in that lowest fee tier. Um, so it's gonna be really interesting to compare your results with the results from the actual survey. But we do have a small number of members in that, in that, in the next step up, that 1 million to 5 million level. Okay, so that's, that's got us practicing with the polls. So next up, one of the questions that we asked these members is how many full-time staff members do you have? So I'm gonna pop up that same question. Okay, so how many full-time staff members does your organisation have? So I can see the votes are coming in. Looks like a bit more of a mix now, which is which is very interesting. I'll give it a few uh, few moments for folks to keep voting. Okay, that looks like the votes have closed down. So let's share the results. So it looks like there's, for those of you who responded here today, there's a, there's a small 6% who have no full-time staff members. Um, and then it looks like the biggest other tiers are one to five, six to 50. And we've got a, a few folks here with more than 500, so, so quite a large organization. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at how that compares to the results we've had in the survey. So here's the results from the respondents to the survey. So we can see here that a, a surprising number actually have no full-time staff, which is really kind of an, an indicator of the size of organizations that tend to fall into that lowest fee category. Um, so most of them have none or kind of one to five staff members. But we do have some who are larger. Um, as we saw on, um, on your results just now, we do have some members who are in, um, who have a lot considerably more full-time staff members. Um, oh, and I should have said, sorry, for those who can't see the screen, I'm showing a bar chart here um, with different bars for the number of members um, who responded to say they either have no staff all the way up to more than 500. Okay, so let's go on to the next question we asked them. So this this is really interesting. We asked um, members in this tier where their funding comes from. So I'm going to pop up the same question here. OK, so there are a lot of options on this poll. So do scroll down and it should be multi-select. So obviously many of you will have um, get funding from multiple sources. So do do multi-select. Um, Yeah, I can see the votes coming in. Got a lot of public or government funding. Any more? Oh, yeah, votes are still coming in. Give it a couple more seconds for folks to vote. It's um it's a very long list. I appreciate this. It might take <laughs> it might take you all a long time to read through the list. There's a lot of words on this question. Okay, I'm gonna 
end it there. And let's share the results. So it looks like, um, yeah, 48% of those of you on the call today, it's public or government funding. I've uh, got 30% APCs. Uh, we've got nobody crowdfunded, which is disappointing. It's always fun. Um, Okay, we've got some membership fees, some sales of publications, um, subscriptions. Um, yeah, really interesting. So if I stop sharing that, let's have a look at how that compares to the survey responders. So again, for anybody who can't see the screen, I'm showing a, a bar chart again. So the X axis here gives the funding source and the Y axis gives the number of respondents who selected that source. Um, and as you saw from the poll, it was multiple choice. So you'll see some of the options on the X axis are for more than one. So it's interesting to see the largest percentage of responses, just like the poll, is public funding, um, followed by APCs, um, what's interesting, we were quite surprised by quite how many organisations were self-funded. Um, and you can see further along the x-axis, you can see there's some more interesting mixes of funding. So this is really interesting input for us to think about not just that lowest membership fee tier, but also that basis of how we how we set the fee tiers and what's going to be most fair, most equitable. Okay, and final poll time. Um, one of the other questions we asked those members was what percentage of, I'm sorry, I think I've got an old version of the slide here. That should say what percentage of your expenses do you spend on Crossref fees? Um, so let's stick up our final poll. Okay, if you can all pop in. Obviously, not everyone will know this off the top of your head, but uh, approximate is fine. So this is what percent of your annual expenses and it's all crossref fees. So that might just be membership dues, content registration fees, but also if you have an extra service such as Similarity Check or Metadata Plus to include that. Okay, looks like voting has slowed. So I'm gonna end the poll. And I'm going to share the results. So there we go. So the good news is it looks for a, a lot of organisations here. Crossref is less than 1% of annual expenses. Um, but there are some here for whom Crossref is a much bigger percentage, a kind of 5 to 25 or, or even over 25%, which is really interesting. So if I shop, stop sharing that for a moment, let's see how that compares to our survey. So again, I'm just showing a um, another graph on the screen. Oh, hello, is somebody else driving? <laughs> Thank you. I'm showing a graph on the screen that shows um, the x-axis is the percentage of membership uh, the percentage of your expenses that go to uh, crossref fees and the y-axis is the number of respondents. And this very multicolored chart, each bar has a different color for a different continent. So again here, this, this does reflect quite closely to the poll that we just took. So um, most members, um, crossref fees are one to 5% of their um, annual expenses, um, but it does, um, there are some members for whom it's a much higher percentage, and that may well be one of the audiences that we want to dig into a bit more with our follow up focus groups, just to see what the impact is um, of that high percentage. So there we go. That's a bit of background on the programme. 
and also um, some of the uh, data that we've collected so far, some of the interesting research we've been doing. Um, I'm keen to get um, feedback from um, those on the call. Um, if you have any feedback or questions about this resourcing um, project, um, if you do, please, you may have already been doing this, but do please pop them in the Q&A. Um, so if you've got any feedback, suggestions, um, or indeed questions about the project. I'm going to just check how I'm doing for time. Okay, Marina and Ginny, I know you've been in the chat and in the Q&A. Have we got any, um, any key questions that we want to answer? Or if not, I shall continue. For now, not. Uh, we just had a question about whether a uh, university is a member of Crosstrack, but that has already been answered. Great. Good stuff. Okay, so if we go on to um, just what's next um so um as i mentioned before if you are in that lowest membership tier do make sure you've completed the survey if you haven't already um and as cora said it went to the primary and billing contact on all our member accounts so if that's not you do speak to your colleagues and make sure you filled out the survey um, I also mentioned we're also keen to talk to non-members to try and find out if our fees are providing any barriers to entry. Um, so we have an RFI on our blog. Do check that out. Um, looking for more support with community facilitation. Um, and you can join the discussion on this programme on our um, community forum. So we put the full link there. And finally, there's a uh, web page for this programme. So if you go to the Crossref website, if you look in the menu, there's a special projects area and you'll be able to find the project page there. Amanda, there is one question that's just come into the Q&A box that we can answer live. Please, yeah. Um, so this is uh, from Eva. What if we have a contract via a third party, so a national library? How will the fees uh, be affected? Um, and I think that's probably a sponsored member. Yes, yes. Um, I should have mentioned that there should have been a slide in here, um, which has somehow disappeared, um, to talk about some of the other models that we have. So um, the survey was sent to our independent members who are have a direct relationship with Crossref and pay their 275 annual fee. We do have a couple of other programmes to support um, organisations who might actually find it difficult to join Crossref. So one option is the sponsors programme. So the sponsors support organisations who maybe haven't got access to Crossref for certain reasons. It might be financial, it might be currency, it might be technical skills, it might be language barriers, but organisations work with a sponsor um, to join Crossref. And the sponsor pays one membership fee on behalf of um, all the members that they work with. And the other programme we have to support organisations is the GEM programme. Um, so the GEM programme, uh, Ginny briefly mentioned at the, at the beginning, it provides fee relief from membership and content registration fees for organisations who are in the least economically advantaged countries in the world. And we base that list on um, uh, a list we get from the IDA list that's provided by the World Bank. So th the question, I think, is probably from um, a member who works through a sponsor. Um, so... Uh, at the moment, we the research has just been with members who work directly with Crossref, um, but we will be looking at, obviously, what impact this, this has on members who work with the sponsor as well. And can I see another question? Oh, the other question relates to the API, so I won't answer that live. We'll, we'll type an answer in there. 
Okay. Well, if that's all of our questions, um, we shall move on to the next section. Which I believe will be Martin. <clears throat> Yeah, hello everyone. Um, yeah, really nice to speak to you today. Um, it's great, always great to talk to our community as a community organization. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, product roadmap, um, where we are, where we're going, what we're trying, a few things that haven't worked out and, and so on. And we've had some, a few changes in, in the product team and also we're we're thinking about um, how we prioritize things, how we um, how how we manage the strategy and, and, and put things into uh, uh, make make decisions on on what we're going to do next. Um, so where are we at the moment? Well, as it says here, there's a cool new thing, a, a few uh, cool new things that we've tried and they didn't really work out. Um, I'll talk about those in a, in a moment. Um, there's some other exciting new things that we are doing. Um, but one of the backdrops to this is, you know, we're, we're an organization that's 20 years old. Um, some of our technology is 20 years old and we have a lot of technical debt and we need to deal with with that. And we've um, some of it we've put off dealing with um, for various reasons. And we've, we're now dedicating some time um, to do that. So if you can move on to the, the next slide. So um, we know that, uh, as I mentioned, our, our content system, which is the, the system that holds the metadata that our members send us, um, this uh, needs renewing, it needs updating, it has some, some bugs and, and issues with it. And we need to move to something which allows us more flexibility, allows us to plan for the future uh, and keep up with innovations in um, digital scholarly publishing. We've tried to build a, a new system and off the back of that su support services like um, data citations and moving event data to um, a more stable infrastructure. Um, unfortunately, this hasn't gone as well as we, we would have liked. Um, we've, we've made quite a lot of progress in terms of determining a, a structure for the database, um, in terms of setting up APIs and, and so on. Um, but we haven't been able to get to a point where we have something that we can release and let the community look at and uh, and, and give feedback on. So we've the, we, we've we've taken the decision that the best option with this work is to pause it, to have a look at our strategy, and move our focus onto other things um, which have have been in our our backlog, um, and those will be on the the next slide. So what we're focusing on at the moment is bugs, 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 lots of bugs. Um, the, there's there's uh, some of those which um, we, we would like to um, to move forward with, um, especially around the, the REST API and content registration. So these are really core cool services that we run. The REST API is how we deliver a lot of our data to downstream services. And the content registration is how we collect all the, the lovely metadata from our um, from our 20,000 or so members. Um, uh, another really important area we're looking at is catching up with metadata schema enhancements. I'm not going to talk too much about those because um, Patricia is, is going to talk about that um, next. Um, suffice to say that, you know, as scholarly publishing innovates, people say, oh, I would like to send this in the metadata and I can't register this. Can I do this? Um, and we haven't uh, you know, we haven't responded to all of those requests um, and there's there's lots more that we can do in that area. Um, and as I said, we've been reconsidering our prioritization approach. This is still an active conversation, but the kind of things that we're looking at about how we prioritize things are, you know, does it serve our four strategic goals, the one that, ones that Ginny highlighted um, at, at the beginning of the meeting? Are our members ready to implement this? Um, is this something that we can maintain? Um, is the solution robust and, and we're going to be able to keep it going for the long term? Um, and is it something that we are really convinced is going to be around um, long term? It's not something that we're maybe running for a couple of years and, and then and then stopping because there's there's less value in doing that. Uh, and of course, a really um, a really important part of our prioritization 
is to get feedback from the community, to get feedback from from our members, and that's why you know we run meetings like this and and other kind of uh, consultations. So, moving moving on to the next slide. So the, uh, one of the tools that we're using to support this is um, is is a uh, uh, product uh, a product plan, which is uh, which helps us to put together a a, a roadmap um, to say when things uh, are going to happen. Look at the drivers, motivators, and and so on. Um, we've started using this relatively recently. We don't have a public view on it yet, but that's something that we're um, we're working in the direction of, and there is more on the, the strategy page um, of our website. You move on to the next slide. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of the areas that we are where where the you know the product team is is really engaged. A couple of the the motivators. So the first one is co-creating solutions for broad benefit. Um, we're looking at schema development, as I mentioned, and, and the first area that we're focusing on is um, around raw IDs. So um, we're, raw IDs are for uh, identifiers for organizations and institutions, um, and we are looking to um, combine those with, with, with funder IDs. And wherever we accept funder IDs currently in our schema, we would like to also accept uh, raw IDs and also, of course, take them all the way through the system from the metadata deposit. And so in the output, you can also see um, these raw IDs. Um, we are undertaking a community consultation on Crossmark. So Crossmark is one of the ways in which we help to support um, the integrity of the scholarly record, um, highlight when things have changed, highlight how members communicate the, um, the integrity within their, their own editorial processes. Um, and there's a survey which um, hopefully the link will pop up in the chat in, in, in a moment. Um, and we, we invite all members to participate. We've emailed directly a, a subset of our members, um, but we would love to, to get as many as possible. Um, I had a check-in on the survey results yesterday, and there are very few responses from Africa so far. So if you're based in Africa, um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, we're, so uh, up next um, in this area is more schema changes. Again, I'll leave that to Patricia to talk about, um, and also retraction watch data. So you may be aware that we acquired the retraction watch data base um, last year, which um, contains a, 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 a lot more retractions than we have in our own database, and it complements um, what, what we receive from our members. It's currently available as a CSV file. Um, it's renewed on a daily basis. Um, that's kind of the whole retraction watch database, but we would like to integrate it into our REST API and uh, you know other, uh, um, other ways that we expose our, our metadata. Um, and that's something that we're we're working we're working towards. Um, it's also dependent on schema changes, which takes a period of time to to enact, and some uh, some community consultation around that as well. But it's something you can expect to see um, later this year or, or maybe early next year. Can move on. Um, so the other the other driver that we've we've got quite a focus on is is the sustainable source of complete, open and global scholarly metadata and relationships um, basically give us all the metadata that you can and we want to make it as easy as possible for you to provide that metadata um, one of the key ways that we're doing this is especially for some of our smaller members is to have an, a new content registration form um, it's live at the moment and currently supports grant registrations for for funders um, and we're adding support for journal articles um, as well. And I think Lena is gonna talk about this um, a little bit more later as well. Um, the 2024 public data file is on its way. This is a snapshot of all of the metadata that we have that we release for free on an annual basis. We've taken on some feedback from last year and made a few tweaks, so that's coming very soon. Um, as I said, we're focusing on um, bug fixes in the REST API. Um, uh, and you'll hopefully see some improvements there. Um, coming up next, um, I'll, I'll leave the first point here to, to Lena about more content types in the registration form, and better support for alias DOIs in the REST API, 
Um, that's maybe something that doesn't concern a number of you, but for, for some of our metadata users, um, it is an issue because the it's essentially when um, when we occasionally, in exceptional cases, we have to merge DOIs for, or well, not, not merge DOIs, but um, assign um, uh, uh, alias one DOI to another so that it, there should be a redirect from one DOI to another. Um, and this causes um, issues within the, the REST API. Um, technical debt around our record ingestion is something that we would like to, to focus on next as well. Um, we generate a number of reports for either for individual members or for organizations who are interested in kind of aggregate um, information. Um, and also matching is an area that we uh, that we have a focus on. There's various uh, there's various um, places in our system where we, uh, you know, we we create links between metadata records. One of those is, for example, between preprints and research articles. Um, reference uh, reference matching is is another of those areas, and we're looking to gradually renew those over time with some new um, some new methods and new processes. Uh, preprint matching is one where we've um, we've we have a prototype and are looking to um, to implement that, and that's coming up later this year as well. So that was a kind of a whistle-stop tour of, um, of what we're doing at the moment. There's a lot going on. I'm happy to take questions about uh, in individual um, areas and pop them in the, the Q&A um, section. I've just seen one question pop up. Let me see if I can answer that live. Can I include license information in the new registration form? I will let Lena answer that. Um, Later, I, I think I, I don't actually know the, the answer to that, or she can she can type a, a response to that. Um, and I'll pass over, I think, to Patricia, who um, it's the middle of the night for her, so I think we're going to hear a recording of Patricia. Is that right? Uh, yes, exactly. That's what hopefully is going to happen. So we tried that before, and it did work. Uh, but please immediately shout uh, if you don't hear or don't see the recording when it starts. All right, let's try it out. I, oh, sorry, I have to do this recording instead of uh, being here live in person. I'm going to talk a bit about our metadata development process and what we have upcoming in our metadata pipeline. In recent years, we've tried to be very open about metadata development at Crossref. We haven't done a lot of develop metadata development, active metadata development, because other projects have taken precedence. But we now have an opportunity to move things along. So I want to just go over how we want things to work. This is pretty basic and familiar to anyone who does any sort of development or project management, but it's a, a good process to keep in mind. First and foremost, we want an open and transparent process with lots of community input. Um, we get many requests from our community that um, the request might come in as a support ticket for our support team. They might be in, from an informal conversation, an email, um, a more formal request from a working group, like a NISO DISC or SDM committee might uh, request us to consider something. Um, and when we get a request, we take them all very seriously. They often mostly come to me. Um, I consider whether the metadata that we're, we're requested to consider has value to our community. Usually it does. <laughs> but more importantly, whether the metadata is something our membership is able to collect and send to us. Uh, we also consider the maturity of the vocabulary or schema that is being proposed, as well as the wider adoption within our membership. There is a lot out there that is valuable, but we really need to focus on what our membership can re register with us easily. Uh, we don't want to throw up barriers or make things frustrating for uh, our members when they're trying to adopt um, new, met new metadata. Once we've decided we want to consider something, I take a closer look at the proposal and decide how it fits into our metadata overall and whether it is something that we can consider and something that, that we can include in, in our metadata records. If it is something that will be adopted by journal publishers, for example, um, the most probably the most basic example 
Is it supported by the JET specification? If it's book funded metadata, what does our book advisory group think? Um, it gets a bit more challenging with other types of metadata model models like grants or reviews or preprints. Um, we work with specific communities to advise us on how to best support them. Um, more and more we get requests for metadata that is not type specific and is more related to relationships, which fits well with our overall vision. Next, I come up with a plan to mark up the metadata in XML and how to best to support it in our JSON outputs and ask for feedback. That means at minimum, a post in our community forum, but it also might mean discussions with various working groups, internal and external cross rep, blog posts, discussions, meetings, and other types of outreach. We've also been experimenting with a pipeline API that will allow us to model inputs and outputs from registration XML to JSON via our labs API that may be brought into play for larger and more complex metadata updates. Then we move on to production and making the metadata possible as something our members can register with us and something our metadata users can retrieve from our APIs. And then the actual hard work of helping our community register and understand the new metadata starts. Um, but that's an entirely different story uh, for someone else to tell. Um, As mentioned, so I'll, I'm going to move on now to what we have planned and hopefully we'll get, maybe get on to in the next uh, two quarters. As mentioned, we are working on supporting ROAR as a funder identifier. Work for that is ongoing and will happen. Uh, when that happens, we'll, I'm sure, make a big deal about it, update our documentation when that becomes real. Uh, next, this is exciting. We've been planning to support type citations for a while. By this, I mean adding a type to the citations you supply to Crossref. So specifically, when you register a DOI record, you may include a list of items cited by the thing you're registering. Uh, we're adding a simple piece of metadata that allows you to flag what type of citation it is, whether it's a journal article, a data citation, software, a book chapter. Uh, it's very basic, but it's important and it will help identify citations downstream and potentially help make connections between citations for things that do not have DOIs, or at least do not have DOIs identified. Um, this was circulated for feedback a long, long time ago, and is it's pretty basic, so I don't feel like we need a huge community discussion about it, but I'm going to do a short post in our community forum about, about it, just asking for any last comments on the list of supported types. We don't want to live, leave this list entirely opening, oh, entirely open as that just causes chaos. Um, keep in mind that this is just a preliminary list for our first pass um, for supporting this and will evolve over time. Uh, so there is opportunity to change it in the future. Next, very exciting, uh, I do have a prototype based on a first round of feedback that I sent around a few years ago uh, for methods to expand support for contributor roles within our met met metadata. So we have our own internal list of roles for individual contributors that include author, editor, translate, translator, and a few others, uh, but we only allow one at a time. So you can only say, okay, this contributor is the author. They can't be an author and a translator. Um, they can't be an author and an editor. They're only one thing and people are many things. So we're going to allow multiple contrib contributors. In addition to that, in addition to our own limited list of roles, we'll also be supporting the credit taxonomy, um, which I know is very exciting news for some people. Um, <laughs> I have plans up in a GitLab repository and we'll be making a more detailed post to our own community forum soon about this, as well as reaching out to some interested uh, parties, as I know there's been some ad avid interest in this. In addition to the metadata changes, there may be some changes code-wise on our side, um, but nothing we can't handle. Um, so we'll get it done and get this supported. Um, so yeah, if you're a GitLab or GitHub person, feel free to take a look at the repository now if you're not 
uh, wait for the community forum po post. If I've been in touch with you, I'll probably be in touch with you again. All right. We also have some updates circulated amongst our preference advisory group. These include some additions for versioning and status of preprints, some refinement of language tagging for preprints, um, some recommendations for relationships for preprints. We've also had some discussions within the preprints advisory group about this already. They're weighing in for another week, then I'll open it up for wider feedback from everyone, then we'll get the updates on our roadmap. We've also had several rounds of feedback for some updates to our grants schema. Uh, they've been delayed for various reasons, but we need to and will pick them up soon and get them out for wider feedback as well. And in the planning stage, there is a definite need and interest in expanding support for multilingual metadata and just language support overall. And some of that support is pretty obvious. I mean, there's some places in our um, metadata where we just need to add language fields, but I think we also need a broader discussion about how we can best serve this kind of material and where it is appropriate to require language metadata, for example, versus making it optional, uh, what language standards we need to support because it's not always as clear as you might think. Uh, there's a lot to discuss, so we want to have a limited term working group that will be forming soon. Um, yeah, and finally, there is still a backlog of updates to do, and I want to be mindful of that. Um, they haven't been forgotten. I know based on our survey of last year, uh, many are interested in different ways to tag abstracts as the current method isn't working for them. We also want to support other identifiers in various places. We've had a request to support a variety of dates. There is an ever expanding range of digital objects to support. Um, and we need to make our overall metadata model, model more flexible. Um, we've had a lot of requests to support keywords. Uh, we have a plan to support conference identifiers, but we need to have a lot of conversations about how best to support that. Um, there are some other things as well. So hopefully in our next community call, we'll be able to get more into more detail about what next is up for what we'll be supporting. Thank you. Hi, oh, sorry. I... Yeah, sorry, Bethany. Um, I'll momentarily resume. Not sure why it doesn't skip over to the next one. Here we go. All right. So next up <clears throat> is me. So that's good. Uh, I think Patricia mentioned some <clears throat> upcoming changes to the grant schema. Uh, so that uh, gives me a bit of a tangent uh, of a segue. To, talking, uh, to talk about Crossref and Fundus uh, and the Crossref uh, grant system. Uh, so <clears throat> I suppose many of you might have heard the mantra that uh, the identifiers are essential but not sufficient uh, for um, connecting and describing the scholarly um, outputs and the scholarly records. Uh, and uh, so um, about five years ago, uh, Crossref uh, has enabled um, uh, IDEs or DOIs for grants. Uh, and uh, so here I'll give you a bit of an um, overview about how it's going. So the grant system itself uh, is meant to streamline connecting grants, publication authors, funders, et cetera. Um, and uh, it enables uh, tracking long-term reach and return of research support, especially to the funders, but also to anybody else who's interested in looking at our openly available standardized metadata for grants. Uh, it allows analysis and anticipation of trends, uh, and it also provides a globally unique persistent link and a funded designed metadata schema. Uh, so far, <clears throat> we have just over 30 um, funders who have joined uh, and uh, they represent uh, 86 different funding programs. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there are both uh, national and international funders. There are some private foundations and different associations as well. Uh, and uh, they have uh, collectively so far uh, recorded 120,000 records of grant for grants, which are now openly available through our API. 
Uh, so in the recent months, uh, for example, we have seen uh, the uh, Austrian uh, National Fund uh, joining with uh, registering their back file of 20,000 grants, and more recently also the Portuguese funder other 10,000. Uh, so as you can see, it's uh, once the funder joins, uh, it can be quite a big, uh, quite a big chunk of um, of uh, grants that they can register straight away, and they enter into a system and can then be. Uh, accessible and uh, available to link different outputs to. Uh, eLife uh, has been an early adopter of uh, including grant IDs in the metadata as well as uh, in the um, uh, in, uh, within the of the, the uh, display of the of the articles in particular in this particular case. Uh, and also importantly, the um, Open Research Funder Group and DataSide uh, have published uh, guides for the funders to talk about how this can be used and how this uh, impacts the entire system. As scholarly communication. Uh, now, uh, what's happening now? Service providers are building and extending integrations uh, with the system, uh, with the Crossroad Grants system. Uh, and uh, just last week, we had advisory group call uh, where the funders have been particularly interested in both how to use um, the existing metadata, uh, as well as uh, increasing the take up of this within the metadata. Uh, and they've started exchanging some good practices around communicating with authors uh, about how they can include those uh, in their publications and therefore uh, propagate them through the system. Uh, Dominika Tkaczyk has updated um, the matching results, which she has, I think, shared twice before. Uh, and so I'll show some beautiful graphs from her, but also she's on the call today. So if you have any questions about grant matching, I'm sure she will be uh, ready to share some more insights. Next, uh, we're planning uh, towards the end of June, probably we'll have um, a community call to check in on the progress in those five years. Uh, we would like to kind of, you know, showcase what has been done, um, get more members, uh, more funding members to join and register their grants, uh, as well as um, uh, perhaps inspire publishers and others to start including uh, the uh, Crossroad Grant IDs in their, um, in their metadata and in their publishing. Uh, we are also looking to introduce Crossroad hosted landing page for grants, because having a landing page for each individual grant uh, is um, one of the requirements uh, for st to start registering um, the IDs, and uh, it can also be a barrier to some uh, funders, and therefore we're looking to come to help and bridge that gap. So here are some uh, some uh, graphs from Dominica. Uh, well, actually, I will only show one graph. Uh, so this is um, uh, this shows the increase of uh, grants and re uh, related relationships and linked grants and linked research outputs uh, over the past, um, well, just over four, four years, because we, it was towards the end of 2019 that we started seeing the first grants. Um, and as you can see, when the funder joins, the first thing that happens is that they register a, um, a significant backlog and therefore the uh, the growth of that uh, program is kind of uh, comes in the big jumps. Uh, and then kind of the, the the steady progress continues. So we invite any funders on the call today to consider uh, making the next big uh, the, the next big jump uh, with us. All right. And in terms of the grant and output matching, uh, as you can see here, Dominica has identified almost 60% increase in, um, well, we've also talked about the grants being registered, but also almost 60% increase in matched relationships uh, for the grants that have been registered. Um, and uh, she will be sharing the methodology of how, that, how this comes to, to pass and, and more, uh, you know, more graphs that you can see more insights from uh, in a blog um, in the next uh, few weeks. But uh, I'm sure that if anybody has specific questions about uh, uh, grant output matching, then please do ask in the Q&A. All right. And at this point, I'm sure there is many people interested here uh, to hear from uh, Lena uh, for, uh, about the new uh, registration form. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. OK. Yeah, so we've I think we're slightly short on time, maybe. Um, so I'll try and be really quick and just give you a brief overview of this work. Um, and as I say at the bottom of this, slide, which is going to be shared out so you don't have to frantically write down my email address now. Um, you can always get in touch with me if you'd like to chat some more about this and have a demo or give some feedback. We've already had quite a few questions about this in the Q&A, so I'm hoping there's lots of interest. Um, we love feedback. 
So something that we've been working on in the past few months is uh, taking the concept of a really simple but modern web form that we've already successfully applied with our recently released grants registration form. And we're expanding that concept to a tool that allows members to register journal articles without having to touch any XML. And um, the topic of metadata manager has already come up in the Q&A. Um, as I think many of you will be aware, our metadata manager tool that does something similar has not really been actively supported anymore for a few years now and we're hoping to deprecate it entirely in the future. So um, this new tool that I'm telling you about today is written in a way that makes it a lot um, less error prone and more reliable than Metadata Manager and also uh, is easier to use and more flexible than our web deposit form, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with too. Um, on the next slide, there's some details on kind of how we've tackled this project so far, what we're doing right now, what we're hoping to do next, but I might just um, largely skip this in the interest of time because um, we're coming up on our full 90 minutes and you can read up um, on all of this when the slides get shared later on. Because um, I do want to take a couple of minutes just to uh, give you a sneak peek at the interface itself. So the form is uh, made up of four to five individual basic steps, depending on whether or not you want to add uh, metadata about the issue or volume that the article was published in. Um, and you start with the most important metadata about the article itself. So that's things like title, DOI, landing page URL, contributors, uh, license, as we mentioned in the Q&A, um, abstract, funding, that sort of thing. There's also a raw lookup built into the form that makes it easier to add affiliation metadata because obviously we care about that a lot, um, which is useful. In the second step, we need um, a bit of information about the journal that the article was published in, and you can look all of that up using the ISSN of the journal if we have that registered with us, which makes the whole thing quite simple and helps you find the correct title. Um, the third step, as I mentioned earlier, it's um, you, you may add metadata about the issue or volume that the article was published in, but you don't have to. Obviously, not every journal publishes in volumes or issues anymore, so that isn't always applicable. And then uh, finally, you get a, a summary page that shows you everything you've entered so far, just to check that um, everything's OK and you're about to submit the right metadata. Um, but there is also already further upstream in order to avoid errors. There are a lot of checks and validations already built into the form itself as you enter the data. So, uh, for example, the form wouldn't allow you to enter an ORCID ID with only 15 digits instead of 16 in the first place um, or anything else that doesn't match our schema. So that rather than further downstream getting an error back from the deposit system, you already are stopped by the form from entering something that doesn't make any sense, which uh, especially the web deposit form is not very good at doing. Um, yeah, so that just saves you some time and frustration. And uh, then once you've uh, provided your authentication details and you've confirmed the submission, the form generates an, a deposit XML file in the background and submits that to our system. Uh, you can then go to our admin tool, which I'm sure many of you will know, um, and you can see the XML that was submitted, or you can uh, download a JSON file of everything you've just submitted from this form and then reload it into the same form later on if you want to make any changes to the metadata. You don't have to rekey all the information. It will be pre-filled for you already. And uh, that was the very quick version of, uh, of what I wanted to tell you about the form. It's kind of just a little... Uh, a little teaser or taster. Uh, so look out for our announcements when the form goes live and it's ready for real deposits. But um, in the meantime, if you have more questions, please ask them and really do get in touch with me if you want to talk about it in some more detail or get a live demo or help us with testing. We appreciate it. So thank you. And back over to Cora, I think. Can we see next slide? Yes. All right. So. Um... Yeah, I think we now have just a few minutes. Uh, so if anybody 
has uh, questions about the form, um, please do put them in the um, in the Q and A, and we can answer them right live. Um, obviously, you can also contact Lena later, as she mentioned, on her email or by our community forum. All right, I can leave just um, just maybe a, a minute more for people to to collect your thoughts. Um, oh, here we go. We have some questions coming in, uh, and uh, what have we got here? Ah, okay. Yes, the the perennial question: When can we expect the release of the new form? Lena, would you like to respond to that live? Uh, yeah, sure, actually, I don't have to type, I suppose. Um, yeah, so we um, want to get a functional version of the form live as quickly as possible in the coming sort of couple of months, which uh, might not include every single feature and frill that you might want to see on it or that you know from Metadata Manager in it yet. Um, but that will be really important for us to get um, sort of feedback at scale and see how it works out for people and what the most important tweaks to it are. Um, so yeah, you, there will not be another mid-year community call before you actually get a chance to use the uh, form for real deposit. It's a matter of um, weeks and months, not years. All right. Sure. Uh, thank you, Lena. We have a few more questions here. Uh, one, I think I can answer. The question was whether the web form uh, will continue to be available in the meantime. Um, yes, it is. Um, so uh, please do. Oh, OK. And there is a question from Julian about that is unrelated to the form. Uh, all right. There are currently proprietary online platforms offering to send alerts for specific events whenever one of my works gets cited. How easy or difficult it is to replicate this functionality with Crossref? I think someone from the product team might be able to. I can answer. Say words to that. answer that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Julian, it's it's great to hear about people wanting to do that kind of thing, and there are organisations that use our metadata to do that. Um, the easiest way to do that is just take our metadata and and do it. You know, use something like the the public data file. Um, uh, there's there's options for monthly snapshots with our um, with our uh, metadata plus service, um, and you can keep up to date with the using the API as well. Um, we do provide that service for our members. Um, it's something that we have planned to do as part of the new infrastructure we were building, um, but it's not uh, well not not to provide notifications, but at least to provide easier access to. To that data and it is something that's available via um uh via event data and maybe i'll drop my i'll i'll write an answer in the q a and drop my email in there and uh if, if you want to follow up um be, be happy to discuss further all right lovely martin thank you all right with this uh brings us to the end of our call today uh so thank you very much everyone for joining uh, thank you to my colleagues for um, giving all, all the updates and answering all the questions here. Um, as you can see, you can uh, contact us uh, on social media as well as our community forum. Uh, please see some of, some more information about those updates uh, on our blog. Uh, some of them is already available. Some, as we were saying during the call, will are upcoming in the next few weeks. Uh, and uh, don't hesitate to get in touch uh, on uh, using the email address feedback at crossref.org. All right, and you can always sign up to the newsletter to be always up to date. Thank you, have a lovely day or evening.